Yes, Lord, we do thank you indeed for the sound that you have given to call us, Lord, to you. We say, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. And you have given us this Sabbath as a special day of rest. Lord, we do praise you and honor you for your mighty creative act that brought light out of darkness. And Lord, for your miracle of redemption through Messiah. May we always be reminded, Father, that the world does walk in darkness until you have opened our spiritual eyes. And when that has happened, we are able to walk with you, to behold you, to fellowship with you and with one another. And as I light the candles this evening and symbolically spread the light, I ask, Lord, that you would spread your light and your love and your comfort and your peace throughout this place and in our hearts on this Shabbat evening. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us through Messiah, the light of the world, and has called us to be a light to all those about us. Thank you, Lord. We bless you this night. Amen.
Experience. We are absolutely living in the most incredible time in human history. There's so many events right now of major significance in Israel as, as well as throughout the world. What we do with our internet news site, just a little history before I can really get into what God is doing in Israel, is we have an internet based website, and what we do is we watch world news that's biblically relevant. Most of our focus is on international news with a majority of our news on Israel and what's happening in the Middle East. My background, uh, a lady asked earlier tonight, would you share a little bit of your background to kind of give us a little bit better handle on, on where you're coming from and what got you to Washington, D.C.? Uh, I uh, spent my first 24 years of my life in Phoenix, and right after college, I started a commercial real estate business in Phoenix and moved to Dallas 24 years ago and lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for 22 years. My background at that time was, uh, or my uh, work line uh, at that particular time, was commercial real estate. Uh, I became an investor, actually started as a broker and then became an investor. I uh, went through the Telus, Texas real estate depression, uh, 1985, I had my own real estate company in Dallas and was in 27 partnerships and properties when the market crashed. And the Lord gave me this opportunity to get to know him very, very well. <laughs> quickly. <laughs> and as Episcopalian without very deep roots, <laughs> I learned a lot. So uh, some friends of mine encouraged me to go to these, uh, these meetings, these breakfast meetings, and I attended these breakfast meetings and uh, was really moved by what I was hearing. And I said, this is tremendous material. Where did this come from? And they go, this is from the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wow, this is a bestseller. <laughs> I'd read Stephen Covey, Tony Robbins, and all these other uh, people, Norman Vincent Peale, and all these positive thinkers, and uh, was impressed by what they had to uh, say. But this was really good material. <laughs> and being obsessive compulsive by nature, from 1989 to 19... Uh, 94, I read 300 books, uh, attended conferences and retreats, was in two weekly Bible studies in Dallas. One of my Bible studies teachers was uh, from Dallas Theological Seminary, and that's where I started to gain this interest in what was happening with Israel. And it was fascinating because at that particular time, I was in the process of doing these financial workouts and attempting to complete these. And you talk about faith. I mean, this is a time of faith. And 
supernaturally, I got through all 27 partnerships unblemished. I mean, just you'd never known I was in any real estate deal. It was a total miracle of God. He delivered me through every single property. Uh, miracles that my partners and, and people associated with these deals couldn't believe what was happening. But this was God in a supernatural way. But what happened during this period of time, and uh, having read all these books, uh, I was wanted to develop a Christian-based personal development program, similar to what Stephen Covey's done, but present the message from the Bible of how to improve the quality of our life. And I was sharing with Richard and Peggy today that I'd spent a tremendous amount of time developing this, this plan. I had a couple literary agents that were interested in representing me and talking with, with some different Christian publishers. And basically the program was great, but it was full of principles and precepts. And as I shared today with Richard and Peggy, it was a, a, a method of how to mature my flesh where I would become more effective for God in my power, my flesh, my performance. Most of us have grown up in a performance-oriented home, but, you know, it's what we're used to. So anyhow, that didn't, didn't work. And a dear friend of mine, my mentor, one of my mentors, said, Bill, I have a feeling you're going to be doing something you least expect. And I go, no, I've, I've invested five, six years into this. This is what I'm going to be doing. This is what I want to do. Well, um, I, 19... 96 May, I heard a gentleman that knew an awful lot about Israel. Uh, he came to Dallas, and I heard what was happening in, in Israel, and it, it was just incredible. I had no idea we were moving at the stage or we're at the particular stage we are in the nation of Israel in terms of God's final redemptive end time plan. I hadn't followed Israel that much because that's a tough, tough thing to follow. It's, I mean, how will anybody ever ever agree to anything in Israel? I mean, the Arabs don't get along with Arabs. And the Arabs have, uh, you know, their issues. Israel has their issues. And I thought, there's no way. But the way this was presented in the timing and the explanation of the Oslo covenants and, and what happened in 1993 with Oslo 1 uh, was truly fascinating. And the Lord moved me from focus on a Christian-based personal development program <clears throat> into focus and study on where we are in, in God's biblical time clock. At that, in, uh, later that summer, I, I, I enjoy information and reading, uh, and I had some friends encourage me. I had two friends specifically encourage me that I should do a newsletter and on the Middle East and what was happening. So that summer I started a newsletter. It was a two or three page weekly newsletter that I would fax to 200 major uh, ministries around the country kind of updating them on what was happening in Israel. And with the creation of the internet that Al Gore put together, <laughs> I thought what a great guy and what a great tool. <laughs> so we started, we started uh, doing daily news postings in 1997. And it was quite an experience. I thought I'd been through a lot of trials in the commercial real estate business, but when I started touching Israel and started touching this, my life turned upside down. I felt like a rag doll in a pit bulldog's mouth. <laughs> I was shaken every which way. It was incredible. I had one dear friend says, Bill, Bill, when you share these stories with, the, uh, with our Bible study, uh, make sure you tell them they're true. They emphasize they're true. Because no one can believe what you're going through. It, 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 they can't comprehend these, the, the, these things that you're going through. And eventually, my dear friend says, Hey, I, I found someone that's been through greater testing than you. He says, I can't believe it. I finally found somebody. And I said, Who is that? And he said, Paul Eshelman. And Paul Eshelman's been involved with the Jesus film. A lot of you have heard of him and, and his work. And Eshelman, yeah, he, he beat me by a nose. And I read his book. But it was an encouragement to me that God was preparing me for a unique plan. I'm not a trained journalist. I had, interesting, I had interest in radio and TV when I was in college. But my main interest was making money in commercial real estate at that time. It was lucrative, and I went into commercial real estate. But God has a plan. And, and I think for all of us, to encourage all of you, God has a specific plan for each and every one of us. 
The, the most important thing is developing an intimate and personal relationship with him. That's number one. And when we get to that point, then he can use us in a special way. Of course, I tried to do all the work for him before I got to know the intimate side. It's just my nature. And, but now the Lord is in control. He is initiating. He's producing. He's creating. He's providing the opportunities. There is no pressure in me. If the Lord sends me home from Washington, D.C. tomorrow, that's fine. I'll go home because there is no pressure on me right now to do anything but be obedient and yielded to him. Nothing else. What was fascinating, right after President Bush, at that time Governor Bush, was elected president, after a 32-day period of not knowing who our president was, but this was great because this put the, the church on its knees for four Sundays in a row. <laughs> this is cool stuff. I mean, on our knees. Because this nation was, at, was, nation was shaking. As you know, at the same time, so was Israel's nation. It was shaking as well. As goes Israel, as goes the United States. But the Lord really put it in my heart to move to Washington, D.C. And you know, when, you, it's, when you think about things, it's, you know, he's been preparing us all for what we're doing way ahead of a year or two or three years. When I was a child growing up in Arizona in a small farming community, I always liked Dallas, especially the Cowboys. At, my grandfather was from Austin. I always liked Texas. So my Lord was preparing me to move to Dallas, Texas from the time I was a fourth grader on. And I eventually moved there. I also have always liked Washington, D.C. I used to say if I, if I had to go that side of the Mississippi, Washington, D.C. would be a great place. And I'd spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C. as a child in high school when I was in student government and things like that. So I was prepared for that as well. But I had no idea why I was going to Washington. But the Lord put it in my heart to go. I told one of my dear friends, I think the Lord's leading me to Washington, D.C. This December 2000. I went to Washington, D.C. for the weekend, and um, just before I landed at Washington and Reagan National, it was, the Lord put in my heart, White House. It was so distinct. You know how the two or three or four words, you just, I knew where I was supposed to be. And I was able to get a hold of Greg Cluxton with Salem Radio Network. Uh, he's a White House correspondent, a very nice guy. That particular day was a slow news day, so I went to the White House to see him, and I spent a couple hours in the White House press room, the briefing room, and Greg you know, told me what his typical day was like, and I said, you know, how do you become a White House correspondent? He says, well, if you have a viable news service, and you do, you've been in the business for about five years at that time, um, you come up here, you, you basically call yourself in each day, you give your Social Security number, information about yourself, they do a background check, and you call yourself in every day for a few months, and when they start seeing you on a frequent basis, they'll eventually, they'll eventually uh, sponsor you, and you, you get your hard pass. And that's exactly what I did. I, uh, well, let me put it this way. I, I didn't know for sure. I spent a couple of days in Washington. I really liked it. I said, Lord, open, you know, I, I need doors open here and doors closed in Dallas. So I went back to Dallas. I really wanted to come to Washington, D.C. because I felt it was so important right now with, with what we were doing with the Internet News Service because Washington's such a major news, news capital and obviously very important with what was going on in Israel. Came back to Dallas, and I still didn't have that... Uh, that uh, confirmation and that God was showing me again I'm the initiator I have all the details and I will take I will move you when you're to move and for 30 days I still hadn't had the confirmation that all of a sudden one day the home I was leasing in Dallas sold it was closing in two weeks the place I wanted to rent in the building I wanted to in Alexandria Virginia came available they never had vacancies but all of a sudden this one came available um, you know, I was doing a little bit of side work. Um, that basically wasn't going where I thought it might go. But the main reason I was up there because I was spending a couple hours a day with a mentor that was explaining to me how to live the submitted, yielded life. That's why I was in this office setting. That, that closed. I was prepared. I was ready to go. So late January 2001, I moved to Washington, D.C. and started this process. On the, on the, way, to Na I mean, on the way to Washington, D.C., right outside of Nashville, the Lord put in my heart, if someone's to ask you why you're moving to Washington, D.C., what are you going to say? You know, in the natural or in the flesh, we would say, you know, this is the news capital of the world. You know, that's why I'm going back there. I want to get into the action. 
you know, being a networker, I'm going to get into the flow. I want to be around. I want to meet people. I want to do this. I want to do that. But no, he said, distinctively, stand by Israel. That's your calling. Stand by Israel. Not the news service, nothing else. Stand by Israel. And he was putting me into a place that was 75 to 100 feet from the Oval Office. And I'm there four to five days a week. And I'd met President Bush when he was a governor because uh, myself and Bill Glass and Bill Glass Prison Ministries, we were doing some, I was... We were doing some work that would help prisoners in our, in our system, in our, in our uh, uh, penal system here in Texas. And I, and I met uh, Governor Bush at the time, liked him. I thought he was a real decent guy and a, and a great people person. And uh, you know, I was pleased that he was elected president. And obviously the prayers of America got him in there by just a few votes. And when you want to really look down to it, it was down to one vote in the Supreme Court. Because otherwise it could have gone on and on and become real messy. But one by one vote, we had millions and millions and millions of Christians throughout the land that basically put President Bush in office. But what was so amazing to me, and what's become very amazing to me right now, is the significance of President Bush's role in Israel. His, and what's very fascinating to me is his father is one that started the Land for Peace process. A lot of you all are familiar with that. But the Lamb for Peace process started in Madrid, Spain in October of 1991, right after the Desert Storm. And basically, President Bush's father said to the, the Arab nations, that we will start a peace process amongst the Israelis and the Palestinians and, and the Syrians after Desert Storm is over with. So President Bush, in an attempt to get them to become part of the ally base, he said to these nations, you know, join us in this war with Iraq and we'll wash a lot of debt and it'll show a sign of solidarity with Europe, the rest of the nations of the world, and the Arab nations. And we will start this process. At that time, Jim Baker and President Bush ex 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 exerted a tremendous amount of pressure on Shamir. They froze some loan guarantees, $10 billion. They put some pressure on Israel to abide. I don't believe President Bush is anti-Semitic. Uh, his, 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 his father, and I don't, he definitely isn't. But this, is, he, this was an attempt to implement the New World Order. And the New World Order, and I, uh, I've had a fascinating experience in the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR. A lot of people have taken the, the CFR to a very conspiratorial role. And what's interesting from being in Washington, D.C., I've had the chance to be in a lot of meetings where we've had a lot of, I've been in the same room of a lot of these CFR members. And there are a lot of decent, quality American people. They have people that work for them, that love them. They are really pretty decent people. They just have a plan for our world today that's void of God. It's a humanistic plan that's developed and determined in their heart and their mind. These are intellectuals, a lot of masters and PhDs. You know, Condoleezza Rice is a CFR member, Colin Powell, Dick Cheney, President Bush's father, you know, Mitchell, the Mitchell plan, and Madeleine Albright. And I've watched them at the White House. And, and they're, they're really sincerely a lot of decent people. They just have a plan removed from God's plan for the nation of Israel. And I'm going to continue. And I wrote about that in our book. And I and I said, let's you know, let's take the high road. Some people call it covert and conspiratorial, but I'm just saying they've got a plan that's void of, the, the they don't acknowledge the significance and the importance of the nation of Israel. And as we know, Israel is God's time clock. Jerusalem is God's time clock. It was fascinating. In, in October 30th, 1991, and what we've done is we've followed the same day events, as the nation. As the United States applies pressure on Israel, catastrophic things happen in the United States. As Israel shakes, we shake. And these events are phenomenal. October 30th, October 30th, 31, 1991, as President Bush starts the Madrid Middle East peace plan, the perfect storm had developed in the Northeast Atlantic, a storm that had developed out of nowhere, which a lot of these events just happen out of nowhere. In the Northeast Atlantic, the storm, this major storm that became known as the perfect storm, the movies and the books, rather than going from west to east, it went from east to west.
developing 100-foot waves in the Atlantic, the largest waves ever in the Atlantic Ocean, 100-foot waves. And at the time President Bush is in Madrid talking about the Madrid land for peace process, 35-foot waves, 30 to 35-foot waves are pounding into his home in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, causing hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. At the moment, next year, Madrid was moved to the United States. On August 23, 1992, as Madrid convened in Washington, D.C., our largest storm in U.S. history, Hurricane Andrew pummeled Louisiana and Florida. It started with Florida and then got to, got to Louisiana. Just, I mean, massive damage, incredible destruction. Fortunately, a, lo a low loss of life. In most cases, there's been a very little loss of life, but we've had hundreds of billions of dollars worth of property damage. It's three of the largest insurance events in U.S. history have a same-day Israel component. When I say same day, that day or within 24 hours. Those three events are the 9-11 event, number two is Hurricane Andrew, and number three is the Northridge earthquake. Each one of them, same-day Israel component. Northridge earthquake happened at the time President Clinton and Hafez Assad are sitting in Geneva, Switzerland, calling on Israel to leave the Golan Heights. And we had a 6.9 earthquake right in the middle of the adult entertainment district in Northridge, California, the third most expensive insurance event in U.S. history. The first most expensive in U.S. history was the 9-11 terror event, terrorism event the two towers in New York City and the Pentagon. What had happened, the 30 days previous to 9-11, the State Department, and with the help of Daniel Kircher, the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, were working with the Saudi government, with Prince Bandar, the Saudi Ambassador to the U.N., and they were working on the most comprehensive message ever to be given by an American president to the United Nations by Colin Powell on September 24th. And what had happened is Israel, it looked to the Arab nations that, that President Bush was favoring Israel. So what happened is the Saudis, through their Arabists at the State Department, basically persuaded the Bush administration officials to work out a plan that would appease the Saudis. And I want to use the word appease because that's the scary, one of the scariest words right now, appease. The Bush administration is attempting to appease Arab nations. Appease means compromising one's principles to satisfy an enemy or an adversary. And that's what we're doing with the talk about Islam, the fact that it's a peaceful religion, or the fact a few people are hijacking a great religion. It's neither. There are some very decent Muslim people, and I have some, when I say friends, I know them. They, they aren't personal friends, but I've met some Muslims that are very nice people. There are some very nice people that are. But the fact is, there are some very radical people causing great problems for the United States who want the end of, of, of the Jews and Christians throughout the world. It's a small group, but they're militant and they're dangerous. But what's fascinating about 9-11 is I saw and we saw God lift his hand of protection over this nation for a moment. Because what had happened, that plan was finished on 9-10, and Prince Bondar from Saudi Arabia says this, 9-10, he said, was the greatest, this was in a Washington Post article, and we have it on our website, this was the greatest day ever in his life, 9-10. And my spirit was so heavy that and I'm not super emotional, but I, it was, my spirit was so heavy that night. I was praying with friends at 11 o'clock that night, and I was fighting back tears on 9-10. And at 8.30, 8.45, 9 o'clock the next morning, a, a, a jet slammed in the Pentagon, which is three miles from my uh, high-rise condo, and I could smell the smoke passing our building. Saw the Army helicopters going up and down the uh, Potomac. Washington, D.C. was closed down. We had fighter jets taking, uh, escorting planes into Washington National. Things had changed. Prince Bondar said 9-11 was the worst possible day one could ever imagine. 
This was the worst day ever for Islam, he said, and the worst day ever for the Saudis. And it was so apparent what happened. It's so obvious because you look right now, look at what our life was like prior to 9-11 and look what it's like today. President Bush is really, in a lot of ways, a friend of Israel. He, you know, when I was there a few months back, the Jerusalem Post did a study, and 70% of the people in Israel said they would prefer him being president right now to 20% for Bill Clinton. The situation right now, President Bush does like Israel. There's four high-level Jewish people in his administration. He respects Jewish people, but it's coming down to the covenant land, and that's really what it is. I mean, he sincerely believes that. Ari Fleischer, great man. Wolf of which I can't pronounce it very well, especially fast, with the, with the uh, uh, Defense Department. Uh, excellent guy. There's other high-level officials, Josh Bolton and others, uh, at the White House that are, that are Jewish, and he respects Jewish, and, uh, Jewish people, and he has a great relationship with Ariel Sharon. But here's the irony, is he doesn't see the significance of God's covenant land. You know, we've sent warnings. I've sent letters. I've sent four letters to the president. I've sent Israel the blessing, the curse, our book to him. He's thanked me for the book and a letter. I have personally hand-delivered the book to Dick Cheney at a, at a Dick Army event in Dallas. Got a nice letter from him. They don't see the significance of the events. A, a, a gentleman, an Israeli official, recently told me, he says, Bill, there's a biblical view, which you talk about in your book, and there's a practical view. We've decided to take the practical approach. But what's happening right now is the, the other thing that's so crucial right now is these events are continuing. You know, and I'm, this next letter is going to be a, a very serious letter because we're moving forward with the quartet plan. 9-11 stopped the concept plan from being given for a few months. It eventually kind of came out in two or three parts. But right now we're at a facilitation and implementation stage with the quartet plan. And wouldn't you assume that the rebuke will be much greater than the concept plan? It appears so. You know, God said in Zechariah, I will bring the nations of the world against Jerusalem and destroy them. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. On, dis on um, September 28, 2000, when Ariel Schron was given permission to go on top of the Temple Mount by the Palestinians, this had created a, a ruckus, and that's when the Alaska Intifada started. But what's fascinating about the intensity of that moment the Lord allowed over a billion people on the headlines of their newspapers the next day throughout the world on September 29, 2000, to find out the battle for Jerusalem had begun. God's time clock is Israel and is Jerusalem specifically, Jerusalem. You know, seven of the top ten FEMA events in U.S. history happen on the same day Israel is being pushed. Tropical Storm Allison that you all are familiar with here in Houston happened on June 8th. That storm was a strange storm. It happened, just kind of developed in the Gulf. Sprinkle in Houston, started, sprinkle relative to what happened a few days later, started to go towards Dallas, circled back around Houston, went down to the Gulf and gained strength. And at the time, the CIA Director George Tenet was applying pressure on Israel and the Palestinians to go with the ceasefire agreement Tropical Storm Allison sat on Houston, 28 inches of rain in 24 hours, and caused billions of dollars of damage. The largest tropical storm rain producer in U.S. history. President Bush's first natural disaster. George Bush Intercontinental Airport was closed as well. You know, President Bush had five same-day events last year, huge events. March 31st last year, I mean, and to preface this, the first 75 days of President Bush's time in office were very, very smooth. And he wanted to be a facilitator, not an active participant in this process. That was really what his plan is. I don't want to be, I, he said, I don't want to be actively involved. March 31st, Hosni Mubarak from Egypt came to the United States with King Abdullah from Jordan coming a couple days later, scheduled to come a couple days later. And as Hosni Mubarak is landing in, in Washington, D.C., 
China, one of their fighter jets bumps into our reconnaissance planes and sends it to, our gra sends it to the ground. President Bush's first international crisis. When Schroen was in town, when Pre Prime Minister Schroen was in town a couple weeks before that, the news was Ariel Schroen's four days in Washington. He was the news. On our parade at the Pentagon, I mean, everywhere he went, it was on the front page. It was a incredible coronation to a certain extent. But when Mubarak's in town, the focus is China. Then King Abdullah comes to town to try to get President Bush reinvolved in the peace process and, and get him behind the Egyptian-Jordanian peace initiative. He comes to the White House a few days later after talking with Christian and Jewish leaders trying to get them behind the Israel, is Israeli peace process. Uh, King Abdullah comes to, I mean, King Abdullah finally gets to Washington, D.C. Ten days after Mubarak's visit, comes to Washington, D.C. And after, right after he left, the next day we get our folks back. May 21st, President Bush and Colin Powell come out in favor of the Land for Peace Mitchell Plan, which most of you are familiar with. Basically, Israel, we want you back to the U.N. We want the, it's the U.N. 242-337 resolution. We want you back to the 67 borders. And President Bush and Colin Powell accepted that on May 21st, and that's the day that the news came out that Senator Jeffers was leaving, leaving the Republican Party. And that created a legislative and judicial nightmare. Fifty pieces, called the Dashiell 50, 50 pieces of legislation were, were, were left and not, not dealt with. The, the House had passed it, and Dashiell would sit on it. Many conservative judges that the court so desperately needed were kept from having hearings. It was a legislative and judicial nightmare. June 8th, CIA director, we covered that. 9-11, we covered that. October 2nd, the day that President Bush came out in favor, he mentioned his favor of a Palestinian state, is the first anthrax case in 25 years cost the government billions of dollars, disruption of the mail service. And then this year we've had like four or five events this year of these major fires all started. At the time we were in active, the United States was in active negotiations with, with the Covenant land. January, I mean, June 8th, President Bush and Mubarak are sitting there at Camp David discussing the Covenant land. The first fire, the first major fire of the season started in Colorado at, in the morning, the same morning, President Bush sitting there at Camp David. It ended up being Colorado's largest fire ever. June 18th, the day he's supposed to give his Middle East plan, the fire started in northern Arizona and became a massive fire. Then President Bush was supposed to give the message on June 19th, and the suicide bombings stopped those. And that's when he said, enough with Arafat. I won't deal with him anymore. And then on June 24th, he finally gave his Middle East plan, which is basically pretty much the form of the quartet plan right now. His next public address was supposed to be at the G8 meeting. But no, 4 o'clock that afternoon, June 24th, he finished his Middle East address, and he, had a, he, he changed his plans and flew to Arizona at 6 a.m. to stand by the fires and declare this one of the largest fires in Western U.S. history. He marveled at the size, 500,000 acres, beautiful pine trees burnt. As Israel's land's at risk, the United States' land is at risk. As our property's at risk, I mean, as Israel's property's at risk, our property's at risk. We've lost hundreds of billions of dollars in, in property value, in, in damage, property damage. We've had probably over a trillion dollars worth of market capitalization wiped, wiped out. And I've provided this information to the staff. I think we're making some headway, but I don't know if it's going to be on time. But I know God has a redemptive plan in this. I know he has a plan in all of this. That's the good news. But what's happening right now, and I think this is what's so crucial, and I'll mention this one. This is interesting, and I think we're making some headway. They've acknowledged our material. Uh, you know, the Lord said the last two letters, write the letter to the president and carbon copy his top six people. Condoleezza Rice, Ari Fleischer, Carl Rove, Andrew Card, Vice President Cheney, and Karen Hughes. Karen Hughes, I was in Young Republicans with her 20 years ago. I didn't know her very well because I wasn't that active, but Karen's looked at me a couple times like, you're out there. <laughs> but Ari Fleischer 
senses something's there. And Karen's come back to Texas, but, you know, Karen just like, you know. But, you know, you have to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear to understand this. You have to have a sensitive spirit. And I'll mention this, and I'll get into this replacement theology concern. Uh, on 9-11, uh, I just got my hard pass, and I was able to go to the White House. It was incredible because there was only seven of us in Ari Fleischer's office 15 minutes before the president was going to address the nation. And I walked in there, and there was, you know, Ann Compton and uh, Terry Morand, David Gregory, uh, Bill Plant, the, the major CBS, ABC, NBC folks, and me in the Oval Office. They're well known. I'm not. And it was so fascinating to be there because they'd been flying around with the president all day long with Ari Fleischer. But they were there. We walked into Ari's office, and there's the FEMA director. He just came out of the Oval Office. Uh, Joe is real tight with the president. And he said, this is, this, I can't even comprehend this day. He says, I was with the 200 of these people in New York that lost their lives a couple weeks ago. These were the New York, these, these were New York's finest, these firemen. They were, they were the top. And he was, there was an emotion there. President Bush, I mean, what, I mean, how can we, I mean, management of our own lives daily is a challenge, but how about, how about having to deal with an issue like this? This is incredible. This was a president that was going to be our education president. The faith-based initiative, no child left behind president. And all of a sudden he was having to deal with the largest terror event in U.S. history. But what was fascinating is Ari Fleischer was talking about what the president was going to speak about that night. He'd look at his notes and then look at me. And look at his notes and then look at me. And look at his notes and look at me. Over and over and over again. He didn't look at anybody else in that room. But I'd been warning them through letters. Don't touch the covenant land. So we all know God has his perfect timing in all of this. Part of the problem right now, and you all have heard about this, is replacement theology. Believing the church has replaced Israel in significance. And this, this, is, this, is, a, this is a big problem. What's the irony, for the lack of a better word, is President Bush's top staff are all from the replacement theology churches. Andrew Card's wife is a Methodist minister. Condoleezza Rice's father was a Presbyterian pastor. Her grandfather was a Presbyterian pastor. She's a Presbyterian. Karen Hughes, Presbyterian USA elder. Vice President Cheney, Methodist. President Bush, uh, Methodist, Episcopalian, now Methodist, but he still goes to the Episcopal Church. And probably the closest one to the president that could, could say something, and I don't, you know, it's, this thing is uh, it's almost a, it's a runaway freight train. I know God's got a plan in this, but I mean, it would be John Ashcroft, who's an Assemblies of God and has a heart for Israel, and his dad was an Assemblies of God pastor. And Barbara Richmond, a lot of you know her, Barbara, uh, her daughter's uh, one of uh, Ashcroft's top assistants, so he, he knows about Israel. He knows about the significance. But if you talk to a lot of Israelis today, the United States is standing with us. And that's the irony. It's coming down to the covenant land. The Abrahamic covenant. This, this land that goes all the way from, from Syria through Jordan, through Lebanon, through Israel, down to Egypt, which Israel's only on 27% of the property. We're dealing with, this is a personal battle with the God of Israel. The nations of the world do not realize right now this is a direct battle with the God of Israel. And we know the outcome, and it's not going to be pretty for a lot of folks. And it's sad that our churches in America and churches around the world are not telling, are, 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 are so lost from the truth, are so out of, out of line with the truth. I mean, my greatest challenge right now, as far as there's a few of us supplying this information to the president, but our biggest problem right now, we're competing, for the lack of a better word, with the, the Pope and his 900 million people and one in four voters in the last election. President Bush has had two meetings with the Pope. We know where the Pope stands. We know that he wants part of Jerusalem. We know where he stands in the covenant land. You know, he wants peace, but it's, it's not... You know, he's, he's embracing Islam. But God's dealing with the Catholic Church as well. It's incredible. 
This time last year, I think tonight's the last day of Ramadan. I can feel it in my spirit. I think this is the last day. <laughs> Something's going on. But the fact is, this time last year, he called on Catholics to do a one-day fast in honor of Ramadan and our Muslim brothers. Three weeks later, the bishops of the Middle East came out and called, Israel, called on Israel to leave the occupied land. Not disputed land, the occupied land. And then January 24th, 25th, this is all within a period of about four or five weeks, he has a conference in Assisi, Italy, a world peace conference. That I don't see world peace in the Bible until the Messiah shows up. And it's a, it's a peace conference in Assisi, Italy, and he takes out the crosses and, 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 and paraphernalia from his church. He'd cross anything to make them feel uncomfortable. He took them out of the church. Three weeks later, the sex scandal hit the Catholic Church. And the president now is not visiting, as I, best I can tell in his schedule, he is not visiting every cardinal in every city that he's going to. Last year, he, or earlier this year, and last year he was because he was after the votes, the one in four votes. Every time he went to a city, he would have breakfast, lunch, or dinner with the cardinals, or the cardinal in that, in that city. The other problem is the World Council churches and the National Council churches have supplied, had a letter writing campaign to Secretary Powell and President Bush saying that Israel needs to leave the occupied land. And then we have members of the Reform and Conservative Jewish organizations, rabbis, which is 85% of American Jews that also, who were in favor of Daniel Kircher, who was the guy that coined Land for Peace when he worked for Jim Baker back in the early 90s. And they're saying, come on, give up a little bit. It'll get you peace. It'll get you security. So this is, you know, it's going to take a miracle for the president to change his course right now. We're outnumbered, but that's okay. God can handle that as well at his particular perfect time. But right now, we're dealing, we're competing with the Vatican, World Council Churches, National Council Churches, and the Reform and Conservative Jews, who are all in favor of some land being given up. And what's happened now, and I, the President Bush, it's, this is really special, Errol Schroen has been the most active uh, of all the world leaders. He's been at the White House more than any world leader. He's been there seven times. And Ariel Sharon and President Bush have good rapport. Uh, and in the State Department, as well as most of you know, that's our biggest problem right now in America is who's controlling them. The Council on Foreign Relations, the ones I talked about earlier, are the ones that have this plan. And, and initially, in the early 90s, they said, yes, we want the New World Order, as President Bush's father talked about right after Desert Storm. But the plan was, we want this New World Order plan, and, and we'll just coexist with Islam. And at the same time, try to work out some peace in the Middle East to make our one world, new world order fall right into place. It didn't work. The Middle East is more dangerous than it has ever, ever been. Every neighbor of Israel but Jordan right now has weapons of mass destruction. Other nations are acquiring it, Iran, Iraq, Libya. It's never been in worse shape. And this has been a 10, 11 year peace process? And the situation right now, I mean, look at our terror war. You know, there's been about five different, uh, in the last 11, 12 months, there's been five week to two week periods when President Bush or one of his top staff makes a comment about Israel's covenant land, we end up having terror warnings for a week to two weeks, one after another. And these are from our FBI director, CIA director, attorney general, vice president, national security advisor. And, and I'm putting this together. And Lord's showing me this right now. So we've had literally five of these in 11 months, five little pockets. And what's happened now is we're having them almost every single day. And I was, and I was praying about it last week. And the Lord, I said, Lord, what's the, what's the significance? He says, September 27. It was a quartet meeting in New York City. And we've literally had one almost every single day since September 27. This is an indicator to me that this quartet, we know the quartet map, the plan, the road map, is, is, is seeing God's fury build. We can see it, we can sense it in our spirit. 
but that Schroen Bush meetings have gone so well and so smoothly in the, in the crescendo was the October 16th meeting and I've made some friends with some of the Israeli press and we marveled at the peace and just the general uh, spirit of the moment. It was so calm and relaxed and Schroen says President Bush is one of the, he's been a, he's been a blessing to the nation of Israel. He's been such, he's, he's, he's a tremendous president and he couldn't say enough good things about President Bush. He had two days of wonderful meetings. Uh, he, he goes over to the uh, Blair House that night, and they said they've never had a head of state lead his people in, 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 in I mean, serenading songs, especially, I mean, these were Israeli songs. They've never had a head of state lead his people in songs. These were Israeli songs. He was ecstatic. He left Washington on a cloud. And then there started to be some government problems. But what's interesting and, interesting and also sad is there's been six major statements made by Israeli officials this year about them being in favor of a Palestinian state. Three times by Shimon Perez and three times by Ariel Sharon. And what happens is when, when Perez said to the EU, Israel is in favor of a Palestinian state, massive homicide bombing in Israel. When he told the UN we're in favor of a Palestinian state, another massive suicide bombing. Again, he said we're in favor of an accelerated state, I think it was May 17th, we're in favor of an accelerated Palestinian state, a massive suicide bombing. God for a second lifts his hands of protection over Israel. These are tragic, horrific events. I've had friends that have lived through them that miraculously survived him. But God is trying to get our attention. And the, and the good news to this tragedy is every time these homicide bombings happen, Israel tightens up defensively. They went into Jenin and took care of 50% of the terror infrastructure in Jenin. Their big problem right now is in Gaza. But then recently, the last, the last three times, Ariel Sharon has specifically said he is in favor of a Palestinian state living side by side. The same tragedies happen. 90% of the suicide bombings in Israel are averted. And the, and the other ones that happen are small loss of life and small injuries. One life is too much, but the small ones, but they're small and very little injury. But these six times, and there's been another eight significant homicide bombings, and we have actively been on the ground in Israel, pushing on them to agree to a ceasefire agreement, agree to a roadmap. So what's happening right now is I see a level of, of confidence that we might be getting close to working something out. And what I mean by that is the United States, and I think part of this was spoken in those meetings on October 16th, is the United States says they, gave, they said something in that meeting that gave Ariel Schroen that peace. And Bush and Cheney, who I loves Cheney has a heart for Israel, Bush does, Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense, you know how straight shooter he is right on when he talks about Israel. He sees the situation for what it is. And when you want to really look at it, these people do have a heart for Israel, and I think they are good friends to Israel, but it's coming down to God's covenant land. And the big concern right now is in that October 16th, I'm all but convinced that President Bush told our, I mean, Ariel Sharon, we will be there with you militarily, we will help you with loan guarantees. Because what was interesting is a, uh, Ari Fleischer put out a, a press release that day that emphasized how incredibly strong the Israeli economy is, the resourcefulness, and the fact that they are a significant trading part with, partner with the United States. It was, there was some, I saw, why did he say that then? Well, because right now we're talking about a loan of 8 to $10 billion dollars to Israel by the United States to help their economy. So we're gonna, we're, they're looking to us as their savior, militarily and financially. And, and, uh, and I wish this wasn't happening, but I know there's a plan in all of this, but the fact is this is giving them a level of peace and security. But the trade was the number one thing that President Bush asked for is, Ariel, I, we want a Palestinian state. We want a Palestinian state. And the Lord showed me the other day, you know, imagine this, a Palestinian state on God's covenant land, 
a split Jerusalem on God's covenant land, settlement freezes on the mountains of Israel, the tearing down of settlements in Judea and Samaria to satisfy the world, the world community on God's covenant land. An acre is too much, especially to the enemy of Israel, especially the one that wants to drive them into the Mediterranean, especially the one that says one thing in English and says another thing in Arabic, especially a faith that goes on TV and on the streets and in the schools that calls for the destruction of Israel. But the good news in all of this, and the Lord's emphasized this many times to all of us, is the fact is the world is siding with the Arabs and the Muslims, and God is with Israel. The God of Israel is with Israel. Not all these nations want to see the devastation and destruction of Israel, but there's probably 54 Muslim nations that are members of the United Nations that would like to see that. There is a deep-seated historical issue here that we refuse to address. And the Lord's reminded me is our nation's security, and it's so apparent right now. When you look, look at pre-9-11 and post-9-11. Pre-9-11, I mean, we didn't have anything like this. We didn't, have, we didn't have to go through the airport security that we have to go through right now. We didn't have to go through background ch checks. Or the civil right, I mean, our civil rights are diminishing, and, and just all kinds of things that would have got Bill, Bill Clinton impeached are being implemented for, the sake, for our own personal safety and security. But we know that the Lord has a plan in all of this. And I think right now, going forward, uh, as far as what to pray for, you know, obviously we continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I think the other thing, I, I, you know, I, I'm so close. The Lord has me in a unique place right now, and I know that the light will come on at some particular time. Some of the administration will say, you know, there's something to this. We've tried everything. We've gotten books to the, the, the Christian mentors of President Bush, uh, we've, we've moved material all over the place coming into Laura Bush. I mean, you name it, it's come in from everywhere. Laura Bush has received two copies, Vice President Cheney, President Bush, uh, on and on and on. You know, and right now we're putting a lot of Michael W. Smith is very close to President Bush and has a heart for Israel, so we've been working real hard trying to get Michael to, you know, see it. He's a, you know, Don Finto is, uh, they're tight, so we're hopeful that something will happen through that that avenue. But at this point, unless there's a change, we're going to continue to push and push and push. And I, I, mean, I even see a, a sense right now that we finally got a plan that's going to work. And right now, December 20th, looks like it's going to be the quartet meeting. Israel asked to put it off till after their January 28th elections, but the State Department has not wanted to put it off. They want to deal with this now, and Colin Powell is the one that's sponsoring the meeting in Washington, D.C. Unless it's put back right now, our big December 20th meeting will be the meeting that puts this final roadmap in place that will call for a, um, a Palestinian state by 2003, full implementation by 2005. So, you know, that's, this is, this is where we're headed. We have a, President Bush, they're wonderful people. I mean, I mean, sincerely mean that. You know, President Bush is walking into what his father started and what Bill Clinton started. And he sincerely wanted to be the education president. But he, I marvel, as, as I mentioned many times, I marvel at the role that God has him in right now. I marvel at how good a job he's done with a really tough situation. And he's moved by the fact that many people are praying for him right now. And there's a lot of people praying for him, but there's very few people praying for him about the covenant land of Israel. And a lot of people in the American church, and a lot of Americans would say that we are, if we had to take a side, we'd take Israel's side. In a lot of ways, you know, we are there for Israel. But that's the irony. Isn't it incredible? It's coming down to this covenant. This Abrahamic covenant, this everlasting covenant. 
And I know the Lord has a significant plan in this, but as, as John, uh, John McTurnan, who co-wrote the book with me, says, God is using Israel as the anvil. Israel will be used to destroy false teachings and false prophecies and all these leaders that have been pushing on Israel to give up their covenant land and all the billion-plus people that they represent are going to marvel at this. Many, very few people are even aware. I mean, very few pe people are even really, really aware of uh, the prophecies in the Bible. And this is going to be the most incredible wake-up call. You know, 9-11, a lot of pastors around the country said, you know, that first week afterwards said God had nothing to do with 9-11. No, he didn't do it, but he didn't stop it. Which I saw, which I see over and over again. Over and over again, I see God's restraining hand stop things from happening. It's really remarkable. But... Fortunately, about a week and a half to two weeks later, Bill Bright, uh, Jim Dobson, head of the Southern Baptist, head of the Assemblies of God, David Wilkerson, Pat Roberts, and Jerry Falwell says, folks, we keep this up. There's going to be more of this. The talk for the 30, well, actually the talk for the 90 days prior to 9-11 was stem cell research. We had an obsession in, in Capitol Hill with stem cell. And President Bush spent months and months and months making this decision. It should have been a quick one, even, even, a, even though it was a compromised decision, even though a few people, Christian leaders, said, were thankful it wasn't worse. But to put this in picture is the talk on Capitol Hill went from 910 being stem cell to 912 being terrorism, nation under attack, bioterrorism. The scientists that had been working on stem cell are now working in bioterrorism research. Bio, I mean, for the most part, stem cell is not even conversation now. It's not even that, it's not even an issue. Our survival is an issue. And so as we go forward, we just have to continue to pray for our leadership because we have decent people in office. They have a different plan and a different agenda. But, you know, we can't, Necessarily, and blame's not the right word, but we can't put all the pressure on the leadership because these quality, principled people didn't hear about the importance of the nation of Israel in the church or their Jewish roots. Richard and Peggy have experienced that for many years on the road, doing this, speaking about the Jewish roots throughout the, throughout the country. So God is using this situation, tragedies, but there's good news too. He is in control, and that's what we're seeing day in, day out. He's totally in control. And as we go forward, God is going to do something very, very unique. And I, you know, this isn't a time, I mean, this is some heavy news, and this is some, this is some intense news, but I tell you, I have days of just absolute joy. Because we believe in, in our Father. We, we believe in our Lord. But to see him be this active and to see him pursuing Israel, to close, he is in hot pursuit of the nation of Israel. He loves them beyond anything we could imagine. Israel is still the apple of God's eye. And the Jews are still his chosen people. And we have been blessed as Gentile believers to become part, as Romans 11, we become part of that blessing. And another good news right now is Jews and Christians are coming together like never before. And that's the good news about the time we're living in because the Jews are becoming comfortable with the Christians and the Christians are becoming more comfortable with the Jews and there is a sincere love that's pouring out of the Christians for them and it's the Jesus in us God loves Israel and he is going to be victorious in the days, weeks, and months ahead God bless you all
Praise God. Hallelujah, brother. Thank you so much.